All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, final session of our Saturday. We're delighted to have Blake Morgan from Botches Eight. Uh, I've done a fair bit of work with myself over the over the over the last few years. Delighted. Thank you so much for coming along, making some time on your Saturday. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, really delighted to hear what you have to say. I'm really excited to see what that might mean for us and our, our singers who are here and, and, and watching back later. So Blake, great to meet you uh, on this platform and uh, yeah, but take it away. How, how, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good. It's a bit, a bit cloudy in London, kind of like some sun coming in and out. We just had a session yesterday doing some uh, some fun uh, movie soundtrack type stuff in, in the background of uh, um, lots of droning and that kind of thing. So we're down in London currently and everybody, everybody lives in different places in the UK. Obviously, I come from the States originally. So um, for me, I actually, I live up in Scotland, but I'm down in London. Most of us have to like commute down into London and stay here for a few days since the working model is so different. So currently, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still in London, actually at Andrea's flat right now, which is fun. So we get some, uh, her gin collection behind me. Yeah. And, uh, some awesome artwork of uh, Paris and Audrey Hepburn behind me. So great and stuff. And so are you, are you going to be stuck kind of in London for a while? Because traveling allowed, you won't be able to go back up to Scotland for a while. When we work in London, yeah, I have, I have to end up couch hopping a little bit and crashing with friends over here. Um, as do a few members of the ensemble who live up in Manchester and you ends up in Scotland. So uh, it's, it's a bit crazy for some of us, but I think mm. we're, we're all very happy that we still get to sing together. I mean, we're, we're very lucky to be able to do that. So... Yeah, I think we'll, sure. we'll cut along. In, no in normal times, you of course been traveling an awful lot anyway. And right. so, did you? Do, why did you decide to move to Scotland? I've always, I've never asked you, and I've always won wondered what it was. What, what drew yeah. you up there? What, like, how did you balance that in your brain? Like, what was the, uh, what was the process for? Well, I think we're quite similar in, in the conversations we've we've had. Neil, we're both quite spiritual people who are moved by nature, and yeah. so that's something for me. I'm, I'm really. Um, inspired by nature and I think I spent about four years living in London and uh, it was great I mean I, I, London's a great city um, but I, I I think I enjoy it more as a as a tourist um, or as someone who just works in London every, every so often having rehearsals or, or concerts and uh, Scotland is I mean Ed Edinburgh is where I'm based and it's just beautiful to have the ocean on one side and then you know these medieval like cityscape in the center of town and then you can you know, to take a car drive 10 minutes out of town and be immersed in, in mountains and nature. So um, I, I love, I love that aspect about it, but yeah, it's um for in normal times, you know, when we're touring, it, it works great to just have a little setup over in Edinburgh and spend our days off there. Cause we, we really don't rehearse very much in London in, in normal days, but now nowadays it's like, whenever we have work, it's going to be in London. So everybody has to move to the center of the city for a, a few days at least to do the sessions and things. Yeah. Cool. Well, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming along. I'm excited to see what we have, have in store for us today. The kind of brief was like style and stuff like that. But I I also know that you're so experienced that, you know, I said when we were organizing with Paul and Anne, you know, Blake's workshop greatest hits, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> you bring to us was going to be brilliant. So looking forward to it. Well, I'm stoked to, I basically, I think I'm going to run it more like a, a glorified music listening session. So if we can, I'll just kind of hang out and share thoughts and share music for a little bit. I think that's the best way to do it. And I'll go through different uh, kind of a myriad of styles here, maybe starting with the things we're most familiar with, like um, some opera and some some art song and that kind of thing, and then moving into some vocal jazz and then maybe, maybe even some experimental, uh, you know, external vocal techniques like throat singing and all that fun stuff. So yeah. we'll, we'll get there at the end. But for now, we'll start we'll start with the known and then branch into the unknown, hopefully. Great. And we kind of scheduled a couple of hours, but our sessions have been running an hour and a half or something like that. So, you know, don't worry Sweet. about the, 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 the time finishing. You don't have to kind of put it right up to five o'clock just because you feel like you, you know, you need to. So, um, yeah, however it goes. We'll see. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think I'll start then um, with everybody. I know that there's some people that are going to be catching up uh, on, you know, Facebook or YouTube later on. But I'll start with a little song that we can all sing together. And it doesn't matter if you're joining us live or later on, you can join in with this one. Um, I, I'm really sort of passionate about breaking down this barrier that we've kind of created in this pandemic of, you know, everything's done now on Zoom and uh, FaceTime and all that kind of stuff and WhatsApp video chat. And so it's difficult to actually make music and sing together in the moment. And so I've um, come up with like a temporary solution. I, w I don't know if it's a solution, but it's a, a kind of a workaround. And that's just pre-recording some tracks and looping my voice. And then you can join in whenever you feel kind of ready with it. So I've got a piece that um, is, is a bossa nova. And I'm, I'm not sure if you guys know what a bossa nova is. It's a music that 
uh, kind of originates uh, in Brazil and in Latin America and that kind of thing. And I'll get into more of that style of singing later on in the workshop, but for now we'll just start in that style. And underneath everything is this kind of underlying pulse of a hi-hat that goes... And if you've never done a hi-hat before, it's actually pretty easy to, to do if you just do a TS consonant. So, so we're starting the session here with beatboxing, but that's all right. Um, so if you, if you all just try it with me, just go make a TS. Ready? And and then if we do that pattern, the one that goes try that. That's going to be the fallback. If all else fails and you get lost or something, just go back to that. Or if I get lost, we can always return to the hi-hat. So we're going to kick things off here with this little track. It's called Blake's Bossa. So here's our hi-hat pattern. Go ahead and try that on. And then we have a low drum on the off beats that goes like this. The lower the better. Try that out. And then we can snap on beats two and four if we like as well. This is our groove. tones and basses. Let's try to sing this part here. Keep that going. And then our tenors. in the room. Sopranos. Second time you stay right there. Try that out. going those four parts we've got a little bass line here to make a little more sense of the harmony nice and loud confident singing we're going to change the pattern now to the hi-hat rhythm on short do's just like this so same notes, just as a different rhythm. Nice 
nicely done. So we can stop singing that now. The track's just gonna take that over. And I'm gonna teach you a little melody now that you can sing whenever you feel ready. I'm just, I'll sing it through a few times. Join in whenever you feel like it. It goes like this. One more time, have a listen. Try that out. One more time through for you guys. Repeat after me now. Here we go. La 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 do. La la do de a. La la ba ba ba. La 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 da da. Wee wee wee. Wah 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 wah. Wah ba 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 ba. Nice job, everybody. We're going to jump back into those parts we learned earlier on the do's. Those four parts. And now we're going to close to plum, the P-L-M. And how short can you make that sound? Like a pixicato string being plucked. Time will open up to long and sort of breathy ahs. Make it as smoky as possible, like a bowed string instrument. Close it up, we're all gonna go to the hi hat pattern we learned earlier. Last time. Nicely done, everybody. Give yourselves a round of applause. A digital song we can try to sing together. Nicely done. I'm sure it sounded beautiful. So um, that's the style of, like, like I said, bossa nova. And we did many different things in that. There was some difficult chords that we learned, uh, things that actually are quite difficult to learn on page. You know, looking, looking at those harmonies on page, you might have no idea how, how that's meant to go, but learning it by ear suddenly seems a little bit more simpler. And that's the thing with um, a lot of these types of, of genres of music that we're gonna talk about today is that many of them are actually easier to learn uh, when, you're, when you're just hearing it and, and learning it by ear. We also did some really cool uh, instrumental sounds, which is something we do a lot in Vacha Say. Um, things like making horn textures or string textures. And in fact, I might even try to play some videos of what, uh, what we do within the group. Um, if I just go down, you have to bear with me a little bit in terms of, uh, I'm not the fastest person at some of this stuff, but um, we got a lot of tech to go today. Like I said, I'm, I'm gonna try to run it like a, kind of like a glorified music listening session. So we'll go through a lot of different types of things. And in Vacha Say, we do lots of, Fun stuff. So I'll play a video of us singing Straighten Up and Fly Right on YouTube. 
Um, it's a fun one because I get the lead in this. And in this, you'll hear many different things, including an ad, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> cool. So now if I share my screen with you guys. Can we all see that? Give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Awesome. So here's us singing straight up a flyer. I'll just, I'll just play a little bit of the video. I buzz a took a monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was a square. Buzz a tried to throw the monkey off of his back. The monkey grabbed his neck and said, Now listen, Jack. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and stay tight. Straighten up and fly right. Go down, Papa, don't you blow your child. Ain't no use in diving. What's the use in diving? Straighten up and fly right. Go down, Papa, don't you blow your top. The boss are told the monkey, you are choking me. Release your hold and I will set you free. The monkey looked the boss of it's so touching, but it's sound, which is like a lie. Straighten up and fly, right? Straighten up, straighten up. So we'll stop there. Um, but we do tons of different styles of music in Fortress Day. You probably know us best for the all, all the classical stuff, all the, you know, Eric Whitaker, Lux Eterna, Lortzen, some Bach maybe even too, if you're a big Bach fan. Um, especially if you've been to Milton Abbey, you've seen many of our different types of things we do. But we we usually feel the end of the show with a lot of that pop and jazz kind of thing. And you'll hear in that piece, there's everybody doing the um, instrumental. So in that piece, we have saxophones making that kind of smoky. And the horns come in. And that's all done just with the voice. The voice, I think, is the most expressive and it just has tremendous capability to make crazy different crazy noises um, and we'll get into some of those extended techniques towards the end but um, for now let's just let's just see if we can sing that little phrase and we'll talk about uh, laying it back in a second but for now let's just let's just learn that little riff it goes but do Try that out. One more time. Cool. So with this phrase, we can do a lot of different things. Um, let's focus firstly on creating a really smoky saxophone sound. So instead of something that just ba do ba do ba do, and actually the the correct version is ba do do do, definitely a leading tone there, sharp four. Ba do ba do 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 do. It often gets a little bit approximated and a little bit flat, but if we can try to keep that high, that'd be great. Um, but as we sing that first line, thinking of that as a, a little bit more of a smoky um, and almost a little bit closed down in the, in the vocal mechanism. So rather than ba ba do ba do ba do ba do do, so which is quite open, we kind of want to almost relax the vowels a little bit and, and just um, think of it as, as being a little more lateral rather than tall lateral space. So ba do ba do 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 do, that kind of sound. So let's just see if we can make that saxophone sound. We'll just focus on the beginning. So one, two. A one, two, three. One more time. Another cool thing you do thing you can do is add a little bit of breath behind that sound. So rather than something that's more um, a little bit edgy, but kind of think of it 
as having a little breath behind that. So you can, I'm not sure if you can hear it in the microphone, but there's a little bit of breath coming. That sort of sound. V works really well, as I think as well, because you, uh, the sound of the saxophone doesn't have a ton of attack on it. It's not it's always so we'll sing that one more time adding a little bit of breath thinking of closing down those vowels a little bit and also um just linking everything nice and legato so one two one two three Cool. And you notice that I'm not I'm not necessarily picking really any vowel or consonant to or syllable to sing. It's a it's a little bit lazy and that's kind of the, the, the best way to sing it, I think, is rather than thinking ba do ba do ba di do do da or whatever you want to pick, I'm actually kind of picking an omni vowel uh, that's not too open, but just kind of and do and d be kind of you know, they're really relaxed, I think. Um, and that works really well for that particular style. Uh, as we get into, uh, you know, maybe the style that most of us are more familiar with, um, some classical stuff, I just want to uh, say a little bit about myself and where I come from. Obviously, I have a, a little bit of a different background and a bit different accent than the rest of the ensemble. But I grew up in the States originally, in Detroit. And my dad uh, used to play in a lot of Motown bands. He actually used to be the drummer for Tina Turner way back in the day. So I was raised in a lot of um, kind of you know, smoky bar environments, places that a, a three-year-old kid really shouldn't be. Uh, and my dad actually built me a kick drum pedal and um, raised me on the drum set when I was just a little kid. So that was my very first instrument. When I when I couldn't quite reach the uh, the kick drum, you know, he, he built like an extension pedal for me to, to hit the drum. Um, so that, that's really my my first instrument. My, my, the thing I sort of am tethered to is the drum set. That's, that's where I, my home base, I would say. And then I learned how to play some guitar and piano. Growing up, I was in a lot of rock bands, but didn't really start singing in choir or anything until college when I entered as a jazz major. So um, at Western Michigan University under this guy called Steve Zagree, who's not around anymore, unfortunately, but he is a, just a total legend uh, in terms of the vocal jazz scene in the States and um, really kind of took me under his wing and helped me to start singing in, in groups, vocal jazz groups. And that got me hooked on, on choral singing. And then uh, I joined the classical choir that got me hooked into classical music and then uh, joined the opera chorus and that got me linked into the to classical voice, uh, you know, properly singing solo stuff. And so it, the the path for me has always really been one through this ensemble lens. Um, I, you know, I got into classical music because I joined the classical choir and, you know, got into opera because I joined the opera chorus. And for me, I, I just am a, a huge lover of harmony, all, all things of singing together with people. And so for, so for me, I think you have to bear with me a little bit when I talk about vocal technique and that kind of thing, because it really is through the perspective of someone who who just loves singing with other people with choral music. Um, but I've, I've always been really moved by certain pieces and certain singers. And I think I'll start with someone that we all love and know. And that, of course, is um, Pavarotti singing Nessun Dorma. And I'll just play the very end. And I want you to listen for a few things. Um, but firstly, watch, watch his expression in his face um, and also check out the the type of singing he's doing um it it's called squillo which is the, the the kind of the brilliance in the tone the um the resonance is very very high so if i skip this ad and then share my screen with you guys uh this is this is a video that many of you have probably actually seen i'll just play the end of it
nice. And then James Brown. The next video is James Brown, which is hilarious. James Brown and Pod Rowdy. If you if you haven't uh, surfed through YouTube and watched that one yet, that's that's one for a, a good time at home with some popcorn, I think. But for me, that video, I mean, um, it, it's from it's like kind of the pinnacle of of his career for me. Um, there, there's actually a, a documentary released about Pod Rowdy that you can watch. Um, I, I recently saw it on our very last trip to the states, our, our very last tour we we did, which was back in February. Um, and I watched it on the plane, and it is incredibly moving. So I definitely recommend that one. Uh, but his his life is so cool, and the way that he developed. I mean, there's also videos of him singing as a 20, 27 year old or something like that. When he just he sounds just as brilliant as he did there. But there's a a particular brilliance in his voice. There's a, a high tone that's created, which allows him to cut over the top of an orchestra even without the microphone, and that's called squillo. Uh, there's other names for it called people call it blade or edge, uh, mask resonance. Ping is another word for it, but it's that that sound in classical singers that allows them to project to the back of the hall. And physically, what's happening is there's a very high sort of overtone-like sound that happens way up in the, into very high frequencies, and that just kind of acts like that knife that just really allows us to pick up on on that sound and allows us to latch onto it. Um, and I'll get more into to frequencies and harmonics and stuff like that later on, but. I think that's something that in classical singers is a very pre pre present and kind of a crucial noise that we have to make um, to do that. And one way that I like to explore that sound is actually through the um, any sort of nasal consonants like m or n. Um, and maybe we'll just experiment with that a little bit now because I love I love the, to collaborate and to um, have you guys singing as well, even if I can't hear you. So maybe what we'll do is um, do something like m in the middle of the voice. And as we do that try to keep the sound as forward as possible. You want to feel the buzz in your nose, in your, in your mask. That's the, you know, the really pretentious singer term that we say. Um, and, and almost feel it buzzing between your eyes. Like you should feel kind of a rattling sensation. So if we sing, mm, and then almost think in, inside of our mouths, like we're singing, ah. So it's like, ah, um, there's a lot of space happening. Just do that for me and make maybe like a noise, mezzo forte or even forte. If we do that on, mm, so maybe we'll use this note here and, if you're a lady up singing up there, so mm, ready and mm. so hopefully you can feel that that kind of rattle rattle sensation it almost makes you want to itch your nose or kind of you know um, get something out of your eye because it just feels feels like it's buzzing. So if we maintain that amount of resonance and just do mm, try that with me. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. and we go up one. Mm -hmm. And one more. Mm -hmm. And then one more. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's certain registers where you feel that buzz even more. And that's usually the case for, for many of us singers. And there, there's just certain places in our voice that seem to work a little bit better than others. Uh, you know, you have your money notes. Barney calls it the golden fifth in Vatus eight, um, which for some of us is a golden fourth, um, you know, myself included. So there's, there's particular parts of the range that, you know, you, just, you can sing all day, every day. It feels great. There's a ton of resonance, a ton of blade. Uh, and and no, no matter where you are in the hall, people are going to hear you sing. You know, that's that, that kind of range. Um, so maybe there's particular parts where you felt that buzz even more, but this time we'll we'll do it and we'll open it up. And the trick for this is to make sure that that squealo we talked about is maintained even when you open your even when you open your mouth. So um, the temptation for many of us is to go, mm -hmm, oh, and then it all falls back as soon as we open. So if we do something like. Mm -hmm, oh, ah, for instance. Um, we just need to make sure that when we open, you almost chew the sound from the M to the O. So it's like, mm -hmm, oh, ah. that sound doesn't fall back. It all stays forward. And even when we open our mouths, you should still feel that buzz happening in your nose and in your eyes. So let's just try that out. So mm, right here, ready? And mm -hmm, oh, ah. 
and really do think about making it that mezzo forte or forte dynamic. So um, I don't, don't want to push anything, but if you can get the sound in place to kind of launch it when you open your mouth using that M, get the sound in place with the M and then move it forward when you open your mouth. And once again, really chew that M when you open up to the O. One more time, ready? And nice and we'll just move that around just a little bit ready and So I find that's a really great way to warm my voice. You know, when I'm in the shower or driving to rehearsal, whatever it is, I'm always trying to use those M's or N's or NG's even, mm, 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 that kind of sound, to get the sound in a place where I have a lot of natural squealo, a lot of natural upper brilliance in the frequencies like Pavarotti did there. Um, but it's, it is totally possible. There's a lot of people that think, you know, I can only specialize in one sound and it's, uh, it's really bad for the voice, really unhealthy for you to try to sing different styles. Well, I, I would say that for Vulture's 8, we make our living singing different styles. Um, that, that's literally how we make an income. And um, I think to for the modern singer, the modern musician living in the, the 21st century, to make a living with music, you, you have to be flexible and be versatile. And also, I just think life's more exciting if we just stay hungry and are curious, you know, and, and experiment with sounds and um, and just listen to as many things and try as many things as possible. So next up, I'll play a little um, recording of a group called Three Motenas who are, one second here, um, who are awesome. And if you don't know them, definitely check them out. But I'll play just their opening set of them singing a, an opera piece. La Donna Mobile, which I'm sure many of you know. Share my screen again. So this is them singing La Donna Mobile. <laughs> Sembra un amabile, leggiato raviso, in biondo in riso, e menzognero. La donna è mobil, qua più mal vento, muda da cento. E di pensier. So obviously, uh, you know, absolute consummate musicians here. They're they're incredible singers, um, and have have the classical chops down. But then I want you to listen to um, some things they do later in the show. And this is a a John Hendrix transcription of a solo called Twisted. He's written lyrics to a, a, a vocal lead solo, and we'll talk about what that means in a second. But for now, just take a listen to this.
Ladies and gentlemen. Good grammar and spelling are important, mm -hmm. but if you want to write essays that inspire. Mr. Thomas Young, he's twisted. <laughs> analyst told me that I was right out of my head the way he described it. He said I'd be better dead than live. I didn't listen to his jive. I knew all along he was all wrong and I knew that he thought I was crazy but I'm not. Oh no, oh no, oh no. My analyst told me that I was right out of my head. He said I'd need treatment. But I'm not that easily led He said I was the type that was most inclined When out of his sight to go out of my mind And he thought I was nuts No more ifs or ands or buts Oh no, oh no, oh no They say as a child I appeared a little bit wild With all my crazy ideas But I knew what's happening I knew I was a genius you know that you're a wizard at three I knew that this was meant to be You see, I heard that little children were supposed to sleep tight That's why I drank a fifth of vodka one night My parents got frantic, they didn't know what to do But I saw some crazy things before I came to Now do you think I am crazy? I may have been only three, but I They just didn't understand the reasoning and the logic that went on in my head. I had a brain, it was insane, so I just used to laugh at me when I refused to ride on all those double-decker buses. Oh, because there was no driver on the top. I think that it's you instead Because I have a thing that is unique and new It proves that I'll have the last laugh on you Cause instead of one head <laughs> I've got two And you know two heads are better than one For just $67 You can make as many videos as you You're on mute Cheers, man. Um, I'd love to have a discussion about uh, not just the ad that came up, but um, the, the differences that you guys hear in those in those two different styles, um, and, and really the, the way that they're that he's making those those different styles, and what what you're really listening for, and uh, the, the nuances in the, between those two things. So, if anybody just wants to raise their hand or unmute themselves and give me a little bit of information about what you're hearing, I know we only have a few people here, but um, what what are some things that um, really stood out to you between those two different styles? In the second one, there's so much, uh, like so much power in the, yeah. you know, it's so cutting when he was doing his, um, some of the, the, well, actually all through it, actually, even when he was with the text, it was really, you could hear everything, re all the words, all the text was super clear and right. super like full on, even though he wasn't singing actually particularly loudly, I don't think. Um, mm. and, uh. I guess that was the same in the first one as well, but there was just a rounder sound generally. His kind of, it was the second one really direct. It's like, exactly. uh, yeah, going straight straight to you, straight to the audience. Whereas the um, first one is almost like he's, they're both there, all three trying to fill the whole space like that outwards. Whereas the second one is like, like laser focus, yeah. something like that. The, the word that we use to describe that in, in jazz academia sometimes is the word vernacular. It's um it's very speech like and it has an element that really I think reaches your ears 
immediately because it does sound more like speech in some ways. I mean, obviously the first the first piece wasn't in English, or maybe our, most of our native languages, but um, I think that for, for you know, for classical singers, we have to modify vowels and do things to make the most brilliant sound in that particular range. And a lot of times with, with vocal jazz, we're not modifying as much and we're really trying to get across the words, you know, no matter what range we're in, um, whether it's super high, you know, even when he was singing high, if you notice, he was like, dip, dip, bip, bip, like he was really like just kind of belting it out. Um, there was no like, hey, like there was, it wasn't lined up like that, but it had a lot of edge, a lot of focus to the sound. And it still sounded like someone was speaking in that register. You know, if you were at a, maybe at a football match or something, you're still yelling and it doesn't, doesn't sound like someone going, oh, it sounds more like, hey, you know, it's like, it, it still has that quality that's very speech-like. Any other any other thoughts or observations from watching that? Yeah, I think or... in the second one it was completely changed of style. It was sounded one minute it was sounding like a trumpet and very like out there and focused. And then he, when he switched to use in the words, it was completely it was more mellow. I thought in the style. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that's one element of vocal jazz in particular that it's um, you're always emulating instruments and especially for the scat singing that he did. And we'll, we can branch into that in a little bit talking about scat singing, but um, it's certainly an expression of, uh, of what comes from instrumental sounds, horns or saxophones, like we were just playing around with doing that little exercise. Um, and also something that he was doing that I think is is very um, similar to some w a way that a saxophone might play is he's doing something called laying the laying it back. So when he's singing that, those really fast lines, you know, da ba da da ba ba da da do ba do ba do da do, he's actually singing a little bit behind the beat rather than going da 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 da. It's not that you know candy shop swing that's triplet. It's more da da do ba do da do ba do da do da do da do, just behind the beat a little bit, and relaxing all those triplets. And maybe some of them aren't standard triplets. Maybe it's not da 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 da, but it's more da 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 da. More relaxed, so there's, um, you know, that that's a very uh, kind of nuanced specialist skill, but that, I think that really helps to add to the style of singing any sort of swing or jazz music. Really, um, any other thoughts before we before we move on? So I'm happy just to, to truck on here. Cool. Um, so I think something we can listen to next is um, a, a style of of singing, a, a singer that I really love, who's Ian Bostridge. I'm sure many of you know Ian Bostridge, uh, being mostly Brits in the room, and he's someone that really got me hooked. On, uh, on classical singing in the early days when I was really getting into it. This is a performance of him singing a, a piece from Winterreise, a Frühlingsstrom. Um, I think it's Frühlingsstrom, it should be. Um, but let's just share a screen here. And I want you to listen for the, the top of his voice when he's singing particularly high, uh, just what he does to the sound. And maybe maybe think about how he's making that sound. Ich träumte von bunten Blumen, so wie sie wohl blühen im Mai. Ich träumte von grünen Wiesen, von lustigem Vogelgeschrei, von lustigem Vogelgeschrei. Und als die Hähne krähten, da war mein Auge warm, da war es kalt und finster. Ich rief in die Raberbombe, da war es kalt und finster. Ich rief in die Raberbombe. We'll stop there. Um, sorry, 
it just keeps playing. Here we go. So I think listening to him sing those top notes, particularly at the end, um, Der Blumen im Winter is He's doing something um, that isn't actually isn't isn't falsetto, because that would be a completely different mechanism. Um, Les is nodding because he, he knows exactly the tenor woes. <clears throat> but there's many different ways that we could approach that. If we were maybe a countertenor, we might go, Der Blumen im Winter is and sing it in falsetto like that, which is a different mechanism than da da, which is more connected to the bottom of, of my voice. And I think that this this technique of singing in head voice and exploring head voice, working those muscles is really important for branching out in different styles. I think it's the, the most crucial thing is mastering the head voice. If you want to be able to sing jazz, sing opera, sing pop music, it's really getting a mastery of, of the head voice. And another another way that I think we can explore doing that is once again through the, the M, but also through yawning, um, which is always a good thing. You know, be, being tired is, you know, finally for once, it's a good thing to be yawning in, in the middle of rehearsal. But um, I really love that that sensation that's quite open and quite light of, oh, because when you hear people yawn, they don't go, oh, I mean, maybe some people do, but I certainly don't. Um, it's always connected going, oh, that's because the larynx goes really low when you open your mouth like that. And go, oh, just try that with me if you go, oh, and maybe this time go even higher, but don't think about going higher. You know, don't tense anything up. Don't, don't necessarily prepare yourself for singing high. Just pretend like you're yawning. And just make a really, you know, um, uh, a very enthusiastic yawn. Okay, so we're going. Ah. Yeah, that's the sound. It's very sort of hollow. And that really, for me, is kind of exercising the head voice sound. It's all kind of up here. And I think to, to be able to master that sound, to, so to be able to make that very hollow kind of hooty sound, but then also be able to close down the vowel. That really is singing for me a lot of a lot of pop a lot of pop songs. You know, if you're kind of in that like, you know, Michael Jackson does that for instance. A lot of jazz singers, Mel Torme sings in that style, um, and it just allows a lot of flexibility. Go rather than you know, like you're not really belting it. You're just saying and it's not it's not falsetto. So I think exercising that that muscle and really working it like any other time we might go to the gym and do bench presses or um you know dumbbell lifts or that kind of thing just making sure that you're smoothing over that break oh, oh, oh and just really exercising and that's a, that's going to be a different place for each of us you know i'm a tenor so for me it's oh kind of up there but if you're a baritone it might be in this range like oh through the passaggio which is the, kind of just the passageway where our voice wants to go somewhere else and you can either, you know, if, if you're a, maybe a bad singer or doing a different type, type of technique, you might want to kind of, um, you know, push it into a certain range. Um, whereas, you know, otherwise, otherwise we just want to make it a clear passage into a different part of the range and just open back up, 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 open back up again. So that's one way that I think we can do that. And Bostridge, I think, is a, a great example of someone who exercises that in a really beautiful way. <clears throat> um, let's see, what else can we get into now? I think uh, a, a group that... Um, I really loved that it talks about um, or it really experiments with all different styles of singing is a group called Roomful of Teeth. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Roomful of Teeth. Cool, this, this will be really fun then. So there's a song, um, a piece I'll play for you guys called uh, A-E-I-O-U and that's... Uh... This is a group of singers from uh, from New York, I think. Actually, they're kind of all over the place now. Some, many of them are, are good friends of mine, but not I don't know all of them. But uh, they sing in a lot of the, the professional choirs in the United States, like Conspirare and Seraphic Fire, if you're familiar with those groups. Um, some of them have been previous members of Chanticleer, that kind of thing. So a really uh, well-networked group. And they actually won a Grammy a few years back for um, this album in particular. And Carolyn Shaw, who is a singer in the group, won a Pulitzer, even if you know Carolyn Shaw. She's the alto in the ensemble. So this is a, a song of that they're doing all different types of technique, but they start with um, exploring in that head voice and kind of pushing the sound into a different register. And what you'll hear is it'll actually flip up. So it's kind of a yodeling, ah, ah, that kind of sound and, and getting into the, the falsetto kind of region. Um, and that's kind of what happens when you sort of overblow in the, if any of you are woodwind players, you know, overblowing ah, kind of forces it into a different register, which is a lot of fun. 
Um, but they're also doing some crazy things like throat singing and um, lots of fun stuff. So this, this is one of their songs. Let's play for you. Stop there. So th I think you know this is a great example of all the different things we can do with our voice, even in the choral setting, even when we're singing with other people in an ensemble, um, and all kind of explored through that um, that lens of of the uh, the head voice. I think um, and messing around with that. Certainly the m maybe not the lower sounds that were happening, some of the throat singing things that were happening, that that crazy sound that was happening down low um, by the bass, whose name is Cameron. Uh, but I think that most of those sounds you're hearing are just simply different types of sounds we can all make. Uh, depending on how much vocal fold closure we have. And in fact, I have a little um, image I was going to share with you guys that I'll bring up here. See if I can share this. This is a, a vocal fold uh, continuum that I saw in a random high school in the States. Can everybody see that? And this is fascinating to me. I think it's something, you, it's definitely a picture because you can see the, the side of it's kind of peeling there. Um, it's not, not an image I downloaded from the internet. Unfortunately, but I think um, you, you, this is something you could definitely hang in your in your room. I think you can buy online. But basically, what this is is um, this amount of subglottal pressure that we're adding in the voice. So, 100% breath to the left is simply a sound that you know sounds like <sighs> all the air is escaping. As we get to the other end, this pressed and edgy sound um, is going to be a lot more uh, kind of squeezed, and it gets to the point where there's just no sound happening at all. If you look at the very uh, edge of it. We have 100% muscle, no sound. So if I just were to do, um, kind of destroy my voice here and go through the spectrum, you'll hear exactly what this sounds like. So if I start with 100% uh, breath, you'll hear a noise that sounds like this. There's more breath escaping than actual tone. And a lot of singers you hear kind of on the radio end up doing this kind of thing. You know, maybe um, some singers that I really love, like maybe Sufjan Stevens, if anybody listens to Sufjan Stevens, um, who's kind of an indie rock guy, um, but a lot of his sounds um, are kind of this thinking outrageously. I write in cursive. I. There's a lot of sound of the breath, and we and we like that because it sounds really intimate. Um, but he's not, you know, he's not using 100% breath. He's probably using something like you know 50 or uh, 60% breath noise is escaping. So, uh, so we get this whisper noise that that happens next, breathy sounds, and then we get voices that are kind of in this. This is our operating zone for a lot of the choral singing that we do. This clear and richer family. Um, I have heard many voices described as fluty or brassy. You know, I think that's maybe some way that we term certain singers. You, you, you know, she has a quite fluty voice or he has a really fluty voice or someone sounds like a, you know, they sound like a horn or a saxophone, maybe on this side. Um, and, and, you know, everybody sort of aims to be in this richer, warm, mellow sound. And that's great. That's, a, that's you know, for our Western ears, that's a, a wonderful sound. Um, but the, also, you know, you get into pop music and you get this pressed and edgy sound which um, isn't always a bad thing, you know, but as we get into belty, um, a, lot, a lot of pop music, a lot of emo kind of screamo stuff is in that range. Um, but then that's a certain sound that we can use as well. That sound that the bass is making, that oh, kind of throat singing stuff is more in that realm there. Um, and if we go completely to the other end, we get something that just stops and it just, you know, it's nothing. Playing with the amount of pressure in the voice allows us to not only, you know, make different types of sounds and different colors and instruments, but it also changes the amount of time we can hold notes. 
And I know that many people, the, the most important thing is breath control and breath support and all that kind of stuff. But there's also plenty of things you can do in the closure of the folds itself to make less air escape. So if you were all to take a, take a breath, we could probably all hold our, hold our breath for maybe a minute, maybe a minute more. And that's because, you know, no, no, no air is escaping at all. If we made a sound that was really breathy, I don't think m most of us would last more than five seconds. You know, I, I certainly wouldn't if I'm making a sound, it's like, <sighs> the air is gone. If I wanted to make a sound that was, uh, you know, a minute long, a minute long sound, I would do something that has quite a lot of um, edge to it. So the vocal folds are really close together. And this is something that we use a lot in Vulture State to make these crazy long phrases, is doing something that rather than, uh, you're even closing it down further. Uh, it has a lot of edge to it, and maybe a lot of overtone as well, but there's not very much air escaping at all. So for me, I could probably hold that note for maybe a minute and 20 seconds. Um, and that's just because I can literally hold it for as long as I can hold my breath because there's there's hardly any air escaping from the sound. But many singers can use this to their advantage to belt very long phrases and hold notes for a long time. So what I'll do now is play a little video of um, a type of barbershop singing. And uh, it's a group called Vocal Spectrum. Or good friends of mine, actually. Um, and we'll go to this one when I see Elephant Fly. And this is a live video. So there's no... Um, studio enhancement or you know dark magic no wizardry happening here it's just someone's cell phone recording i think that they took and i love these these, these kinds of recordings because they're very honest nowhere to hide so this is when i see an elephant fly and i'll just play maybe from halfway through so this is american barbershop so it's a i think sometimes this word barbershop in, in the uk gets thrown around quite a bit with um in, in relation to anything that's acapella you know pop acapella but actually barbershop has its roots in the States and it has a certain style of, of harmony and also of singing. So there's certain chords that can only be used and all that kind of stuff. But this is the American style of barbershop. And uh, you'll just listen for the very last note, the guy on the left, take it, just keep an eye on him. His name is uh, Tim Warwick, and he's an absolute legend. And I think certainly he's, uh, you know, he's got lungs of steel there and can kind of just tank up and hold it forever. But also he's using something, he's using quite a bit of subglot pressure in the sound, which allows him to sing longer notes and there's less air escaping. So I think if you're, you know, if you're in the habit of um, not making it through, you know, many, many phrases in your core rehearsals or just your individual singing practice, I would say experiment a little bit with the amount of pressure on the folds. Um, experimentation is crucial for anybody that that wants to be a versatile singer don't overdo it i think with, with anything you know um moderation is is key but i think if we stop being curious then we, we really lose the ability of, of what music or we, we just we lose what music's all about really you know if we, if we um get boring and just stuck in our, our ways so um definitely experiment a little bit with the amount of subglottal pressure and the amount of just the amount of pressure you put on the folds uh, the amount of closure so i think it, it can really change the way that you, you make these long phrases change the way you sing um as we get into uh, kind of some non, more non-Western stuff, um, I'd love to play a recording of uh, a, a group of a peaking. Has anyone ever seen Peking Opera, which is a kind of Beijing-style opera? It's incredible stuff, um, and they use a lot of 
uh, incredible, uh, just really upper overtone, uh, very tons of head voice in that in that same very edgy kind of style that I was just playing. So I'm just going to share a video of that really quick. It's a sound that it's just, I mean, I, the first time I heard it, I was um, just in awe because I had never heard anything like it. I'm just going to wait for this ad to play through. Great, here we go. I'll just start about here. So the crazy thing is, is that that's incredibly high. So as a tenor, I'm listening to that and maybe maybe less is in the same boat here, but we're listening to that thinking like, wow, that those are like high C's, it's consistent high C's, you know, and it, it's a different way than you might hear tenors normally sing high C's. It, it's, it certainly sounds, you know, like a totally different style. And, and that's really because he's playing with the amount of pressure and, and the amount of closure on the folds. Um, and I just think that's so fun to just mess around with. Um, but you know, when when I when I were to, if I were to sing a high C, which I don't do very often and very well, but um, if I were to go for a high C, it's it'd be a lot. Um, I, I would bring up a lot more weight than that almost, you know, and I'd, I'd um, carry up a lot of chest resonance. But he's kind of living in this zone that's just uh, it's very it's almost some sort of tiny sound, but it still has a lot of blade and a lot of resonance. Um, and I and I just love those you know those those things that are very. Um, they really paint that particular style of that culture in, in a way that I, I just, I, I get so curious about it and I have to experiment on my own. So um, maybe experiment with that as well, if, if you're the type that loves to do stuff like that, but that's called Peking Opera. Um, so I think I'll get back into uh, some, some of the ways that we can use this sound in maybe pop music. And that's really through this, this idea of belting. Um, and you hear pop music and musical theater, all that kind of stuff. There's many people that we listen to that belt. Um, and of course, I think, uh, we, you know, if anybody's ever seen Wicked, there's that piece. I think I try to find gravity. Amazing song. Uh, but she's singing this like crazy high note at the end. I'll just play the um, the end of that real quick so you know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm sure most of us do, but let's just listen to it because it's incredible. This is uh, Adina Menzel singing the very end of um, Defying Gravity. Because it's just awesome. We love it. Someone told me lately Everyone deserves a chance to fly And if I'm flying solo At least I'm flying free To those who ground me Take a message back from me Tell them how I am defying gravity I'm 
we counted 4,490. You're on mute again. What a, what a weird era we live in, man. There's just so many tech fails just constantly. Um, but I, I, that piece just moves me so much. I'm, uh, it's so much fun to, to sing along with that or try to sing along with it and just crack wildly. But uh, that style of singing also has that same amount of subglottal pressure to it. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, I think that we hear that all the time on the radio. There's tons of, of songs that we listen to that have that you know, as a, as a crucial element of that. I'm just going to play invented. a it version of that because there's another amazing thing that happens at the end of a lot of this stuff when you're belting high. Does anybody remember the group Hoobastank? Maybe, Neil, you remember the group Hoobastank, but no, okay. There's a song that you, you might know called The Reason. You might not know the group. It's one of those one-hit wonders, I think, but uh, he's singing The Reason is You, and uh, I just want you to listen to what happens on the word you when you're belting. Because there's some, some crazy things you have to do to your voice to in order to modify vowels and things. Does anyone remember that song now? Does it ring any bells? Yeah, Neil's nodding his head. No, the rest yeah, of you guys, no, that song, not at all. Yeah. That's all right. But so, who can tell me what uh, what they heard on the on that high note there, on the word "you"? He changed the vowels. Awesome. Yeah, he did. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I think that's that's you know a, that's something we hear all the time in this kind of belty um, pop style is that the vowels get changed as you're singing different registers, in particular e and anything that's really close. So ooh, you know, anything like you. Um, gets modified and it's i mean i'm not sure about you guys but um that's the name of a friend of mine from shanghai yao is a totally different thing than uh you you know so um or, or the name of a, a very famous basketball player that i grew up watching yao ming so that that's just it sounds completely different you know um than than singing you and the reason is you you know so um actually changing that vowel is is a way that we can sing with better style in that particular genre if you're in an emo pop cover band you would sing yao on that top note so, and also just easier to, to brighten the vowels and open them up. An opera singer might um, also not sing the word you up, up really high. They might change it to something a little more omni-vowel, like uh, maybe uh up there rather than ooh, you know, um, because it's just difficult in that range to sing in, in the way that we grew up singing, you know. Um, so I think that, I mean, you hear that all the time in pop music. I'm going to branch into a type of music now that um, actually is, is totally a cappella. And it's a way to sing with yourself. Kind of. Does anyone know of Bobby McFerrin? I'm sure Neil does, but anybody else out there? Bobby McFerrin, ring any bells? Cool. That's so cool. I love I love sharing new music. So Bobby McFerrin um, is the guy that wrote "Don't Worry, Be Happy." I'm sure that's the, the easiest way to kind of um, share that to share his name with everyone. If you know the song, "Don't Worry, Be Happy," and what I'll play for you is a song of him. Uh, singing Blackbird by the Beatles but he's doing it by himself so let me just share this and he's also doing some crazy things like inward singing it's mind-boggling it's something that I, I can never I've tried to do this and I just fail completely but here we go Hey, 
Insane. I mean, uh, he, he's got complete vocal mastery over the instrument. Um, and, and, and you can hear that just in the pitch accuracy when he's singing the just moving back and forth. Um, I'll play you one more recording of Bob McFerrin. And this time, um, just activate your thinking caps here. And I want you to listen for um, things that are really characteristic of that style. So kind of listen for the baby notes, uh, the, the, the little nuances he's adding that make it sound in a particular idiom to you. So I'll just play um, a recording of him singing a, a tune called Drive in a similar style, just with himself. After Coleman Wash uh, moves over here. Great, cool. Just have a listen for those little things that he's doing. I'll just, I'll just play maybe a minute of this. so fast no one's gonna catch me stop there so what what are the things that make it feel so good i mean maybe it doesn't feel good to you but for me it feels feels amazing to listen to that stuff uh, what, what are the little nuanced things that you're hearing like the rhythm is so tight yeah like it's so and it's so quick it's not he's not not compensating rhythm and groove for the difficulty he's you know that's really hard and he's not yeah. rushing He's like, it's just the, the pulse is just, you know, effortless. Sitting in the pocket. Yeah. yeah. How does he do that click and sing at the same time? Is, is this doing the click? Yeah, I think he's doing this. And that's a crazy thing that you can do if, if um, you just like experimenting once again, is just is actually singing while you do this because it has an effect. If you, if you hit hard enough, it goes, ah. Uh... So if anybody's ever like, you know, pounded on your back or something when you're singing, which 
I have the lucky experience of, of having that happen to me before because we just do weird things as singers. I mean, you get that whole like, uh, and your, your voice goes, you know, and he's just kind of messing with that and creating a, a shake effect that happens, which gives it that kind of hit, the sound of a snare drum, you know, on the back beats, which is a lot of fun. Does that actually help in change the note from high to low? Well, I don't, I don't, maybe, I'm not sure, but it certainly accentuates it. You know, if you hear someone go, gonna get in my cum, you know, you, you do that on, on the beat. There's that, it's almost a sensation of a flip. That's why we love yodeling so much is that it just sounds so cool when you hear a break between the notes, the da, you know, so that kind of brings it out even further and makes it sound like two instruments kind of going back and forth. Yeah. That's actually what but, um, cellists do when they go to like the lowest, lowest note the, on the low notes. If you're going to go for an open string, they'll flick it with their left hand to make oh, cool. the, uh, to like kickstart the vibration. And that's, yeah. you know, when you go down low, sometimes they just take a little bit more effort to, you know, bass players talk about if you want to, you're going to, going to pump out the lower notes. So it's kind of like, maybe it's a bit like that, you know, to get those low notes out, you've just got to get it, give it a bit of a kick. Otherwise you might only get rather than getting that, that, yeah. the, the rhythm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And that's, it certainly sounds like, you know, that's the, the characteristic of that style where you, you know, with the bass, you, hit, you get a lot of attack, even when you're going boom, 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 you hear like a, either a bass drum pedal happening um, in pop music or, or you just hear a lot of attack on the, on the bass itself. And that's, I think Neil brought up a really interesting point that it, it's really sitting in the, in the groove in the pocket and it's all super, super lined up. But I also think that there's an element there of it not being 100% quantized. And when I say the word quantized, I mean, it's not, everything's not locked into a perfect grid like a machine. There's a human element to it that feels kind of funky and and has a little bit of a um, a lilt to it, and that's something you might hear in funk music quite a bit. Is it's not it's not like it has kind of a you know it's a little bit um, kind of stuttered in some ways, and so I I have some music here that I'd love to uh, kind of break into that concept with. Um, and, what, and I, you actually hear this quite a bit in, in pop music, but it really comes from the jazz idiom, I think. And But it, not just jazz. It, there's there's so many similarities between jazz and early music. And I, I don't know why we kind of moved away so much in the, the classical era from this uh, style of expression, rhythmic, rhythmic expression, um, in terms of uh, vo vocal singing and also just playing as well. But um, you may have heard the term like inégalité, um, which is kind of fitting in, especially as a, any string players, I know Neil's probably heard it, but it's this idea of, uh, fitting in different notes in, into a, into a bar, you know, you might have completely straight rhythms, but you do something with those rhythms that make them more expressive by changing the the length of them just a little bit, just just a very very tiny amount. So, um, just to kind of demonstrate that, if you're unfamiliar with that that inegal style, um, I'll play a recording of uh, Andreas Scholl singing Fairest Isle. I think we all have heard the t the, the tune Fairest Isle before. And uh, the, I mean, if you've never seen the score for this. It's basically a hymn. It's written as complete straight rhythms. And uh, what Andre Scholl is doing is kind of moving those all around, like I was saying. So I'll just play, share my screen here. <laughs>
listening to that phrase, that's written just on the page. But what's happening is they're both playing and he's singing it with a completely different rhythm. It's just, I mean, it's just slightly different, but he's, he's not on the grid necessarily, you know, and that's just a way to be more expressive vocally as either you know, any, any type of performer, whether it's instrumental or, or vocal. I think it's a way to be more expressive with the rhythm itself. Um, and this happens all the time in pop music because I, I think it really stems also from jazz music of that concept I've mentioned earlier about laying it back slightly behind the beat. Um, and there's different types of swing as well. You know, if we have, I mentioned the da 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 and you can slightly relax that by do ba do 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 laying it behind the beat. And that's just a, a way to be even more stylistically expressive in that in that idiom. So um, if you don't know what I'm talking about with the th this being a trend in pop music, um, I'll just play, let's see, what should I play here? Um, a tune by, I'll play a song called Easy by Sun Lukes, which probably most of you don't know, but he's a, um, he's a, actually a composer in New York City who also has like a side um, pop project. And I'll see if I can find the right one here. Actually, do you know what? I think I have it saved away. Here we go. So this is a, a recording of him playing, I think, in New York City somewhere. Actually, no, it might be in France or something funny. But just check out the groove here because it's not 100% just on the grid. As you can hear, that's very, it has a lot of that. It's kind of all over the place. It's not just like we listen to in Ferris Isle. They're using that rhythm, the, the rhythm between the bars to be expressive. You hear it quite a lot. And if anybody listens to like um, uh, Georgia Ann Muldrow, who's quite a rising singer these days, um, she does it in this, tongue, this song called Blam, which I'll play here. Just turn the volume on here. I don't even know no more. It's ridiculous, it's ridiculous. But I'm not knock, knock, knocking on the unknown door. Cause all that I thought I knew before ain't enough for what's in store. We're pinned up inside this ancient war. I thought I knew so much, but we can't seem to do enough. I read... So, I mean, <laughs> I'm now getting into some really niche territory here, but I think that. All this to say, there's there's a button on Logic and in Pro Tools and things that allows it's kind of auto quantize, <clears throat> which allows you to snap everything perfectly to a grid like a machine, and what that does is really just take the human quality out of the music. And um, even if you were to listen to something that is you know on the grid in the pocket, if you zoomed in and looked at where all those beats are falling, if you lined it up to a tempo grid, chances are they'd be slightly off from where that is. But that gives it its flavor and its you know its honesty. I think. Um, and that, that's a way that we can also be expressive is when we're singing vocal jazz or we're singing pop music, we can slightly just relax it away from that. Um, so I'll sort of end here with um, a little bit of the, you know, the, um, the crazy, more crazy vocal techniques, some of the extended things. Um, and I'll start with just um, some, some different types of overtone singing. So I'll start with this lady who does, her name is Anna Maria Heffala, 
and she can do this thing called polyphonic overtone singing. If you've never heard someone overtone sing before, do harmonics. Um, it's kind of this crazy sound. And if your ears aren't tuned to it, you may not hear it, but I think she does a really good job of bringing it across. It sounds like this kind of... So you can might maybe hear those baby high notes that are coming out. If you're not hearing it yet, just take a listen to this and you'll be able to hear the stuff she's doing, hopefully. Or even smaller. So she can actually move independent lines because she's able to control the harmonic that's being accentuated and also the bottom note that she's singing that's producing the harmonic. And <clears throat> harmonics are just, they're in all all music in nature. Every single instrument has them. If you're a string player, guitar player, whatever, we, we know that we all have them. If I grab my guitar, for instance, you can hear that these notes all have these extra harmonics that pop out. Even when I'm not pressing down the string, you get all these extra notes that happen. And what's funny is if I'm playing a note that has a harmonic on a different string, you'll hear that accentuated as well. So, you know, for instance, if I play an E and I let go, maybe you can hear that up there. I hear the fifth actually. So you can still hear it ringing even though it's not being pressed down. So those things are, are, are really common, I think, to hear in, in, in music. And there's ways we can bring them out or um, kind of uh, actually kind of cancel them out. But they really kind of give a characteristic to the sound, I think, a lot of the time. Um, there's a group that does tons of this kind of stuff that I'll just share really quickly before we move on and close things up here. It's a style of singing in, uh, I think it's Sicily, in fact. One second. Here we go. And let me just share the screen here. This is totally wild to me. No me he venido mai a esa idea de venir a Roma a hacer una gara. So 
So we've got a lot of different things happening there. What, what are some things that you're hearing? Because <clears throat> we have different, different sounds for each of those voices that are, that are making different noises. Any observations? I don't know, really. It's quite intense, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, it's very so intense. intense. Yeah. Is that because it sounds like it's a massive choir? Yeah. Does the <clears throat> proximity, they're all singing together. Do you think that's, is that part of it? I think like they're really get... honing in and, and yeah, maybe listening for those, those overtones that are being created and, and locking in with them. And um, will the other overtones that one of them is singing, would that impact the overtones and whatever that somebody else was able to create? Are they interweaving? Yeah, I think like so. With... Yeah. I think so. Yeah, Angela. Is it to, something to do with the resonances of the cave? Because they were singing in a cave or at the entrance of the cave and you could possibly hear it, sort of certain sort of natural frequencies of the cave coming out as well. Yeah, potentially. I, I'd say that, I mean, even in Vatra State, we try to stand as close as we can to each other, which looks a little bit insane sometimes because we're shoulder to shoulder and like, you know, kind of bumping up against each other, which we can't do right now. And that really has impacted the way that we listen and hear, the way that we tune as an ensemble. Um, but I, I think they're probably just getting as close as they can together to make a, a cohesive sound that then kind of resonates out into the cave. But uh, maybe the real reason, uh, sorry, Arden, did you want to say something as well? I wondered if that really loud um, note was actually an undertone. Yeah. Okay. So he's doing something called throat singing. And I actually misspoke. It's Sardinian. Uh, it, it's a particular area of um, Italy that they specialize in this polyphonic folk type singing. Um, and I think that the idea is that that low singer is doing something called throat singing. He's doing throat singing a low note. And that's supposed to sound like the like the lowing of sheep. Or I'm sorry, the lowing of a cow or something. And then, then you get sheep as the next part, the bleeding kind of sound. And then as you as you move up further, it ends up sounding more like the, the sound of the field, you know, the sound of the folk culture in, in Sardinia. Um, but that's a, a style of, of undertone singing that he's doing when he's going, uh, that kind of crazy <laughs> noise he's making down there. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I think as as we get into that concept really quickly of um, overtone and undertone singing, um, there's this this way of tuning things. I'll just touch on very very quickly because um, I love doing presentations on intonation, and I've got a little session up here. Um, but there are different ways to tune harmony based on either the the piano scale, the equal tempered scale that we all use in music. Or we can use the system of overtones, um, and that's just the way that sound naturally occurs in nature. But they're slightly different systems because um, when you sing a low note, for instance, that guy that was going oh, super low, um, there is creating overtones, just like when I played that string on the guitar and you heard other notes kind of resonating. There are other notes that are created when you when you sing a note or play a note, and you have to either fit in with them or choose the notes that are on the piano. And those are unfortunately are two different systems, slightly different. And just to play those examples, I've got a triad using the system of the piano equal temperament that we always use in our Western music usually. And then I'll play one using a system called just intonation, which is the system that it uses harmonics, uses the, the music of nature to tune. So first here is the, um, the equal tempered version. Let me, yeah, here we go. So this is equal tempered. Uh... And then this is the just version, the one that is using the harmonics to tune. Uh... So you might listen to that and think, you know, I don't really hear very much different difference between those triads, but I'm now going to play them back to back without starting and stopping them. Really, I'll just play them um, kind of just back to back. And I want you to listen for the sound of a, a kind of a phasing effect. And what that really is, is the, the wave not looping in perfectly with itself, because the system that we use on the piano isn't isn't perfect. It's a kind of a compromised system of intonation. And so when we're, when we're choosing triads or just notes in general based on the system of the piano, equal temperament, um, there's a little bit of a phasing that happens. It's kind of like a and then I'll play the version that's pure tuning, that's harmonic tuning, and then you'll be able to hear everything just kind of locks in. So here's the first one with equal temperament. And the second one. So equal temperament.
So it's it's just totally beatless. It's pure harmony. And that's when you're choosing notes that aren't the same ones that are on the piano in the, in the equal temper system. So I really think what that group's doing is trying to lock into those harmonies. If you listen to the guy singing the third part, the one that's singing bah, on top in that in that video I just shared, it's just a little bit lower than the note that you might expect on the piano. And that's probably because he's trying to choose the one that's actually in, in the harmonic system rather than the one that's on the piano, if you see what I mean. Um, so it's just a really high level of listening, you know, something that we can really geek out about. Um, I'll just play one more example and then we'll be done. Uh, sorry, I keep going on, but um, of a more undertone singing because I think it's it's fascinating. Um, you maybe heard me do a little bit of it. What I can do is access the very first undertone in in the series. Just like we can overtone sing, we can go do all that, make those crazy little baby notes on top. We can also do them underneath. There's an there's an overtone series that creates notes, and also an undertone series that creates notes down there as well. And what you can do is sing a note and produce. Firstly, an octave below that. So if I go, uh, I can go, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, uh, and all that I'm doing is just changing the amount of closure, and it just it just drops an octave. It makes it sound like it's an octave below, even though it's just the same note. But there's people that can do it um, and create that series so you, you know you sing one note and it drops below that and drops below that and drops below that so i've got a recording of someone who can sing to the fourth sub harmonic is what they're called and he, he's just singing remember these are all these are all sub harmonics related to that initial pitch that he's singing he's still singing the same note but it's creating all these undertones so i think he's singing a b natural And it's just, it's crazy the things that the voice can do. If we, if we actually want to experiment with that, um, the reason that I even found found out about it and started messing around with it is a technique called Strollbass, um, which is a little bit different than the Kargara that you might hear with like, uh, that's the Tibetan kind of like, oh, really more intense singing. I think this Strollbass technique is a little more uh, just gentle on the chords, but we do it all the time when we speak. This, this is the whole reason I discovered that it's, a, it's a, such an easy thing to do is that when we speak, we often fry out our voices especially like in the States and California, people are like always kind of talking like this and just really frying out their voices. And if you listen to that and you kind of isolate that, everyone's just kind of fly, frying out their voice. You get this kind of sound like this that happens. And I wouldn't say don't press into it, but be quite gentle with the sound. And if you sing on top of that and really sing into that, uh, you can get that undertone happening. It takes a little bit of time and a little bit of experimentation, but I think that's just, this is really uh, the, the lesson that I want you to walk away with is, is never stop being curious and experimenting with your voice. Because, I mean, it's just, it is the most incredible and flexible instrument, so versatile. And I mean, that's, I, I fell in love with that. That's part of the reason why I love singing is because of all the different crazy sounds that we can make. So I hope that, um, you know, listening, spending two hours with me playing YouTube videos and watching ads um, has, has just, open your eyes a little bit and ears to the crazy different sounds that we are, that we all can make as human beings. Um, and I hope that you continue to, to check out some more YouTube videos and try to experiment on your own as well. Yeah, that's, that's all I've like, really That was really, that was really <laughs> great. Thanks. Do you have some of those samples as like a, as a playlist? Yeah, I can just send you all that stuff I've just played. That'd be really great. So I know how to find it. That was great. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. I really, really enjoyed that. I've that written yeah. all down. <laughs> oh cool you're all down we'll share it all around yeah has anyone got, has anyone got any questions they yeah ask? please and I, I love to take you know 10 minutes of questions of just general stuff about vulture state about my life about whatever you want life and love and why do you think you'll go back to live in the states maybe at some point yeah i mean um actually my visa is about to expire i have a, a tier one visa i was really lucky to get um kind of the top visa you can get because of um i mean it's a hilarious kind of concept but i ended up being on a Grammy award winning recording in the States. And so the, the group was able to argue that, you know, as a Grammy award winner, that I was able to get this like super high level visa. And it's, it's a great visa. You can kind of do whatever you need to do to get work. 
um, it kind of allows you to act like a citizen for five years, but that's about to expire. So now I have the ability to either apply for citizenship or apply for another visa. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any plans of uh, moving on from the group at this point. So I think for the next few years, I'll probably stick around in the UK. I really love the UK, especially North UK, Lake District and Scotland and all that stuff. It's just gorgeous. Where are we all based today? Is there anybody up, up north or are we all kind of based south, southeast? Well, I know I'm, you're about the, I'm about the furthest away, probably Milton Keynes. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> and Neil, you're in Winchester, obviously. We're all Winchester. Yeah, Winchester. Yeah, I think the rest of us are in Winchester. Yeah. Are Which you, is also are you, a very nice city. Are you writing any of your own music at the moment, Blake? Is yeah, I am. Quite well. a bit, actually. Yeah. Um, and we just because we have all this time off, I've, um, I'm making a new album. And actually, just, just before this, I had a call with a lady over in China who plays um, the Eru, which is a really cool instrument. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's, uh, it's that instrument that has usually two strings. And uh, it creates that really cool vibrato, like. Yeah, maybe Neil, you know how to pronounce it correctly. Yeah, no, I don't know how to pronounce it. But I know what you mean. I saw your post about it. I'm glad you found somebody. Who yeah, has, yeah. Has it. So I'm always kind of writing new music and I love experimenting with um, just weird sounds and especially sounds that aren't, uh, you know, normal for, for me, the sounds that I grew up listening to. I love these things that are foreign to me and uh, playing with those colors. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to keep writing. Are, are you also writing, Neil? I've done bits of arranging and stuff, but not not huge, huge amount at the moment. OK. Um, yeah. Though one of my pieces is going to be part of the next live from London. Um, yeah. That's awesome. So that's cool. Yeah. Is it is it one of the things that we're doing with orchestra? Cause I, or with, yeah, it's I, one of the win, one of the winter house um, oh. program. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Let's Very fun. I think we're doing yeah. Caledonia with uh, strings as well, which will be a lot of. Oh, nice. I sang Caledonia with um, State Home Choir. And yeah. I'm, it hasn't come out yet, though, has it? We've got some uh, some really exciting news coming in the next week. I think about that. So oh, cool. Stay tuned. Yeah. To see we really wanted to release it for Hogmanay, but um, it got a little bit delayed. So. Mm. You know, a, Sc a Scottish celebration of New Year's, I guess, sounds Burn, way cooler. Burns way burns yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you like haggis then? Uh, yeah, I'm, I can't <laughs> take it or leave it. I don't hate it, but it's, uh, you know, one of those things I think you have to like if you live in Scotland and all your friends visit you and like, so what should I do in Scotland, man? And you're like, have some haggis. It's really good. I think it's good. As long as you don't read the recipe. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but vegetarian haggis is pretty good. Uh, yeah, actually, they they make a really good vegetarian haggis. That is a pl pl plenty of those like trendy brunch places you can go in, in Edinburgh. So, yeah, yeah. Should have some whiskey there. Uh, yes, we yeah. have that really nice whiskey, like the pure malt. Yeah, it. it's amazing the price difference of whiskey, you know, in comparison to the states. Like bourbon over here is really expensive. Uh, whereas you know in the states it's not very much money but if you go over to you know, michigan where i live in detroit i actually w went back home for christmas i was really lucky to quarantine on both ends to see my parents for like a few days but if you go shopping to try to get like a decent scotch it's really expensive you know yeah. because of just i guess the export price yeah any other questions regarding music oh i was gonna ask you about trump <laughs> oh we, we can talk about trump in uh in spirits for a very long time but no no <laughs> definitely not not on air <laughs> No, better not if it's being recorded. Yeah. I, I, really, I really enjoyed your um, uh, presentations on intonation at the beginning of, beginning of the lockdown. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, that was great. they were great. Thanks. Yeah, I, I brought in a little bit towards the end here, but... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's just... still on YouTube then? They might be. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a playlist called Live From Home on the Vodges 8 YouTube page. You have to kind of go digging for it. A dark corner of the internet but i'm pretty sure it's still up there we we had a period i guess during march and april um april may it might have been we just did live streams from the couch kind of in our own yeah. place okay. yeah. yeah which is a lot of fun okay look for those great blake thanks so much yeah. um yeah i'll tell you what i'll do is i'll stop the stream